start. Uh, at first, I will uh, introduce myself. I am uh, Ahmed Mitwali. I am an associate professor in School of Pharmacy at Azhar University, Department of Pharmacology. I have been uh, a senior researcher fellow at uh, uh, Liaoning University of Traditional Chinese Medicine, China. Uh, for the years uh, 2018 and 2019, I have been uh, a visiting scholar at uh, the National Center for Natural Product Research at the University of Mississippi in the United States of uh, America <coughs> uh, for the years. Yes, my microphone is connected. Yes, I'm sure. Is the problem of sound with Fatima only or with somebody else? Is the sound is clear for everybody or not? <clears throat> okay. I will continue now. Uh, I have been uh, a senior research fellow at uh, University of Mississippi in the United States for the years uh, 2012, 2013, and 2014. <clears throat> Today, I will talk with you about nuclear magnetic resonance. We will have two different sessions. The first session will be about the theory of nuclear magnetic resonance. Before I start, I know that me and maybe most of you uh, our language, the English language, is uh, <coughs> uh, the English language is not our mother tongue. Uh, so, uh, and so, please, uh, anybody coming, uh, mute yourself. So, because English language is not our mother tongue, so I will try to make my uh, words uh, clear and slow as much as I can. That way we can understand each other easily. <laughs> if you didn't understand anything, if anything happened during this meeting, just send for me on the chat. Okay? <clears throat> Let's continue. Uh, today we will talk about the nuclear magnetic resonance. <coughs> we will talk about the theory. We will talk about proton NMR. This is apparatus of nuclear magnetic resonance. I think uh, some of you may be uh, familiar with this apparatus and some maybe are not. This is not will be our talk today. <clears throat> At first, I have to make some acknowledgments for the people who learned me the NMR, the Nuclear Magnetic Resonance, Professor Dr. Uh, Sapir Prakat, the Professor of uh, Pharmaceutical Chemistry at Azhar University, may God bless his soul, uh, Professor Dr. Hazan Kadri, Professor of uh, Pharmacognosy at Al Azhar University, may God bless his soul, Professor Dr. We have Abdul Wahab, the professor of pharmacognosy at Al-Azhar University, and I, he learned me too much, Professor Dr. Muhammad Abdul Ghaffar, the associate professor in Al-Azhar University, and uh, he shared a lot of experience with me. <coughs> professor Dr. Samir Ross, the professor of natural products in, uh, in the University of Mississippi, he was my supervisor during my PhD, and he learned me too much. This is uh, his photo, to Professor Dr. Samir, uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Muhammad Radwan, uh, Professor of at Alexandria University and uh, the senior research scientist uh, in the University of Mississippi. I learned from him a lot. And finally, the Professor Dr. John Rimaldi, the Professor of Medicinal Chemistry at University of Mississippi, Professor Dr. Uh, Dr. Rimaldi at the 2000, 2014. He was uh, he was teaching this course for his PhD students. I was not a PhD student for him, but I take his permission and I admitted this class. And I take from him the data 
and uh, I take his permission uh, to take this data to learn it to my colleagues and my students. And he he say he said it's very welcome. He was very happy at this time, and I added a lot of other information to his data to get out this course. <coughs> at first, is in the more is important. I think it's very important to just know in the year of uh 1945 it's the first nmr for a solution made by plotch this is dr plotch and for a solid made made by process process made it for paraffin this is the first nmr for a solid paraffin and this is the mill as the first nmr for a solution uh, made by plotch at 1945. just seven years later at uh, 1952 they got a nobel prize for this this man is Richard Ernest. Richard Ernest is the father of modern NMR. Why? Because Richard Ernest, uh, in the year of 1964, he invented the Fourier transform in NMR, and also he demonstrated the 2D NMR. The first 2D NMR was a Cousy experiment, and that was at 1974. At 1992, uh, Richard Ernest take a Nobel Prize uh this man is Vitrish, dr Vitrish. he take also a nobel prize but he was specialized in using nmr for extended and large uh, structures like proteins <coughs> is nmr is important yes it's important of course what can we do with nmr nmr can help us to solve our structures either i isolate this structure as pure compound or i synthesize this structure it gives me a knowledge if my compound is pure or it contains uh, some impurities. Also, uh, NMR is very important to know the stereochemical identification. You know what is stereochemical identification? If, if, if I have isolated a new compound and it has a chiral center, I have to confirm is this chiral center is R or S? What is the configuration? I can use NMR and we can discuss it later. The follow the chemical reaction and it's useful for also the extended uh, chemical solution. At first, we will talk about the theory of NMR. The theory of NMR, some of it depends on physics and some of it depends on chemistry. The theory of NMR is related to the quantum mechanics. The quantum mechanics said, and please focus with me. The quantum mechanic said that every nucleus, every nucleus is spinning like this. It's not stable, it's spinning. And this is spinning of the nucleus gave something called a magnetic momentum, which may be some kind of magnetic energy. If we put this nucleus under a magnet, the spinning usually in, uh, in the nature in a random directions. If we put <coughs> this nucleus under the magnet, it will be differentiated to two or, or, or more different levels. According to what? According to something called the spin quantum number. If the spin quantum number of a nucleus equal to one half, when we put it under a magnet, it will give two different uh you know two different uh levels of energy if it's three halves it will give four different levels of energy according to the rule two times i plus one and what i can take advantage of that this is a table for some nucleuses for example the proton in mr it has a spin quantum number equals to one half when the proton in MR is under a magnet, it's spinning in only two lower and higher states of energy, two lower, two different energy states, lower and higher. <laughs> like that, the carbon 13 in MR, the phosphorus, the, uh, the fluoride, the, clu uh, the chloride 35, the nitrogen 50. All of them are halves and multiples of halves. But I cannot use the chloride because at three halves, it will give me four different stages of energy. The oxygen, 
it's five halves give me six different stages but i can use proton i can use carbon 13 i can use phosphorus and fluoride and nitrogen uh, 15 of course so what will happen when these atoms are under a magnetic field what will happen is when we put this atom under a magnetic field at the first day spinning randomly under an external p node or magnetic field they organized the half of them have uh, they are spinning in the same direction of the p node like this uh, nucleus and the other half spinning on the other direction which make two different energy levels after that i put <coughs> After that, I put radioactive frequency in the apparatus. The radioactive frequency, what does it make? It makes excitation for all the nucleuses from the round, the ground state, the lower energy state to the upper energy state. After a moment, I release this radioactive frequency, which give what give me what give me a released energy. The energy that the the nucleus is accepted, they release it. And I can measure this energy, and this energy is the nuclear magnetic resonance energy. This is a basic concept. Okay, <sighs> let's go further. This is the photos for the energy. So let's repeat it again. The proton in MR, for example, it has a spin quantum number equals to one, which means when we put the proton in MR, under an applied another magnetic field p node it spin in two directions one of them is the lower energy which is the direction with the p node and the other one is the higher energy which is against the p node after that i put some radioactive frequency which make all the protons all the nucleuses in the ground state excited to the higher state when i release this energy the in uh, this radioactive frequency i got the energy and i can record this energy <coughs> let's listen to this with protons have a positive charge and possess a spin due to this they have a magnetic field and can be seen as little bar magnets when we put them to a strong external magnetic field they align with it some parallel or not. The protons do not outside but possess a magnetic field lines. And the stronger the magnetic field, the higher the precession frequency. A relationship is mathematically straight in the lower equation. Parallel and antiparallel protons cancel each other's For NMR, and this video was talking about the MRI, they are the same theory. Uh, two different uh, types of NMR was used. The continuous wave is the old one and free transform it the new one which is invented by Richard Ernest. And this is types of uh, spin relaxation. It's not our, uh, our issue now. So what we need, we need an atom. This atom has a spin quantum number equal to one half. This atom, when we put it under an uh, applied magnetic field, it's spinning in two different levels of energy. The stronger magnetic field make the difference between the lower energy state and the higher energy state is much higher because the stronger magnetic field make the nucleus processing much faster. And when this level increases too much, the energy got it from it, it increases too much. So that is the difference between the weak NMR apparatus and strong NMR apparatus, it's the magnetic field. We need a magnet, we need a radioactive frequency source, and we need a receiver to get this energy and a detector. <laughs> this is a schematic of the, the apparatus. Now let's go to Larmor equation. And in Larmor equation, we have to know this equation. This is mu, mu is means the resonance frequency, the resonance frequency of the apparatus. And this is gamma, gamma means the gyromagnetic ratio. What is gyromagnetic ratio? Gyromagnetic ratio is the specific uh, constant for every nucleus. 
how much fast this nucleus spinning. So, for example, we will find the proton spinning very fast, but the carbon spinning much little faster. So, when the proton is spinning very fast, which means the energy which coming from this spinning, the magnetic energy is higher. If we look at this table, you will find the gyromagnetic ratio for proton is 267 times 100 power 6. But the carbon is 67, which means when I put the compound in the same apparatus, proton and the carbon together, the processing uh, velocity of the processing speed of the proton is four times higher than the carbon. So this is the, the gyromagnetic ratio. This is the applied P node, and this is two pi, you know, you know by uh, the number. So, for example, if we used uh, an apparatus, its strength of P node is 11.274 Tesla, and we applied this equation, the resonance frequency of the apparatus would be 500. But 500 if we use proton. Why? Because when we put the gyromagnetic ratio of proton is 267. But if we use a gyromagnetic ratio of carbon, which is equal to 67, the same radioactive uh, the resonance frequency will be only 125. That's why when we write our papers, we in the experimental section, we write the NMR spectra we recorded on a Fluker Advance, for example, uh, an instrument at 500 for proton and 125 for carbon. If the operators is 400, it would be 400 for proton, but only 100 for carbon 13. This is examples for gyromagnetic tissue. Another thing we have to know. Now, the amount of energy absorbed from the nucleus during the spinning and this release energy, it's, it's, you know, it's directly proportional to the applied magnetic field. But why? When we put it in 200, 300, or 400, or even 900, the chemical shift of the protons is the same. It should be different, but it's equal the same. That's why, because the apparatus doesn't measure the chemical shift or the, you know, the energy, the release energy only in hertz. It's make it in part per million, which means it take the frequency or the energy in hertz and divide it by the frequency of the instrument. So that the net result gave me the, the, the energy or the chemical shift by what? By part per million. And that's why if I have a proton, this proton, I made it on a 60 hertz NMR and it appeared at two, it means it appeared at 120 Hertz, and if it appears and two on three megahertz uh, NMR, it means that this proton uh, appears at 600 Hertz. But in post times, in in post cases, it appears as two parts per million. <clears throat> but of course, the 60 is different than 300. The 60 is low energy because the magnet is low. The difference between two states is low. But the 300 difference is much better, so the energy absorbed is bigger, and the, the energy release bigger, so I can see it easily. And this is the difference between all the operators, for example, and for sure the 900 is much better. This is a simulated data for this compound in 60 hertz, and this in 300 megahertz. 60 megahertz, I'm sorry, and this in 300 megahertz. This is different types of. Uh, uh, in a more. But according to this theory, you know, all protons, they have the same energy. There is no difference in energy. But what is good in NMR if all protons have the same energy because all of them have the same magnetic ratio and the difference between the ground state and uh, higher state is the same. What is for? This is a chemical shift phenomenon. There is another factor. This factor is the electron. The electron which is spinning around the nucleus of the proton. This electron has its own magnetic field. These electrons produce another magnetic field. 
this magnetic field is in an opposite direction to the applied magnetic field. What does it mean? It means that this electron, when it's spinning around the nucleus, it protects the nucleus from the applied magnetic field, shield the nucleus from the applied magnetic field. And what can I gain from that? I can gain an important thing. If this electron is available and present around the nucleus continuously and very available, it will shield the nucleus much more. What is what what is the good for what is good for? When it shields the nucleus, the applied magnetic field will not make a, a big difference between the lower energy state and the higher energy state, which means the amount of absorbed energy will be less and the amount of released energy will be less and the proton is shielded and the energy will be much less and i will see it on the chart on the first of a chart so on the first of a chart we called it shielded area which is the first area because the proton is available but what happened if the proton is not available if there is an electronegative atom just behind or just next to my nucleus what happened this electromagnetic atom will you know will attract this electron to head to it and this electron will not be available so it cannot protect or shield my nucleus so the nucleus will be de-shielded and will affect it much more with the applied magnetic field and absorb much more energy and release much more energy and it will be downfield in the chart or de-shielded this is the basic concept of NMR and the <coughs> chemical shift phenomena and according to that we will study all the all, all, all the next the next uh, the next thing we will talk about the internal standard usually we use internal standard as tetramethylsilan what is a tetramethylsilan this is the structure of tetramethylsilan and we use this compound because it's chemically inert what does it mean standard i make it as a zero point you know in this protons and this carbon the energy of this proton the chemical shift of this proton on the metal groups i make it as a zero point and the chemical shift of this carbon is a zero point for carbon 13 also so uh, the internal standard tetramethylsilan i choose it because it's chemically inert it's not reactive it's give a unique position it's very condensed and in in, in zero it's also volatile uh, you know it's uh it's a it's a boiling point is only 27 decent degree so it's very easy to be volatile it's symmetrical give me good point it's also highly shielded so i can consider it as zero but for your knowledge there's some compounds has a chemical shift less than the tetramethylsilan which we will discuss in the next and also it's very cheap and it's compatible and soluble in everything this is apparatus of nmr uh, when i make nmr i has to make sure about the nmr tube selection it would be uh, you know narrow as much as you can the handling of nmr i i, I work with nmr by myself but i think it would be not suitable to talk it up uh, to take it uh, to talk about this right now but you have to know you have to know the nmr tube you have to make sure that nmr tube is clean you have to make sure your compound is uh... good good that's very good we have, uh, you know, we make sure that uh, the symbol is good. Makes it uh, the symbol, uh, the sample volume is 200 microliter to be concentrated. If I supplies my compound in a big amount, it would be diluted and give me bad data. Especially if I'm working with natural product, we isolate compounds with very little amount. Usually, uh, the sample concentration, all this thing, I have to make sure about it. Not only also about <coughs> when i make the nmr itself on the apparatus i have to make sure about the trimming and lock 
and this is very important to get a clear and good uh, NMR data. Usually we use some solvents for NMR like deteriorated chloroform or deteriorated DMSO. The most common one is deteriorated chloroform because it's cheap, uh, volatile, uh, very pure, and the signal is about at 7.2 and it's very characteristic, cannot be, you know, confused with other uh signals but some compounds are not helpful and it's not hygroscopic it's not hygroscopic like the dm so the second one used is dm so but there is a big issue with the so big side effect is very hygroscopic it's absorbed water and it's appear with me on proton nmr short but if i use the so ample uh, ample the small ample not the bottle usually it absorbs a little amount of water this is table for uh, the most used solvents and their boiling point and how uh, the appearance at proton and appearance at carbon. I will put it for you on the group, the WhatsApp group today. And this is video for how NMR apparatus work. I wanted to share it with you. This is, you know, uh, some kind of uh, propaganda for broker. I'm not for, for broker, of course, but I got this video from uh the internet this is the apparatus of this is going inside apparatus and this is the place of now this is the first session of our lecture i hope you enjoy it uh, if you have any question you can use it on your chat If it's okay, just tell me it's okay to move to the second part.